Hello and welcome to Property Question Time. My name is Stephen Galpin and this is the programme where you can have your property related questions answered by our team of experts. And joining me today are John Howard. Welcome John. Great to be here again, thank you. Good. John's a property developer, author, public speaker and owns a series of estate agents too, I believe. True. All true. Okay, well, welcome back, John. Thank you. Also joining us by Zoom from France is Trevor Leggett. Trevor, welcome. Hi, Stephen. Nice Trevor, to see you. Trevor is founder of Leggett Immobilier, French real estate agents and property advisors. Anyway, welcome, Trevor. Good to have you on the show. John, we're going to start off with you. Your first question yes. is, I am a leaseholder and i am recently asked the local authority to, for consent to make some alterations. I had a visit from a building inspector who identified some alterations made by the previous leaseholder. I've been told that these irregularities must be the subject of either reinstatement or retrospective consent. Is this my entire responsibility or do I have any recourse to either the previous owner or perhaps my solicitor? Very interesting question. Um, it opens a... Um a bigger debate really. So first of all, the first thing is that um, you always need consent from the freeholder for any structural works you're likely to do to the flat. That's what it will say in the lease. Now his solicitor should have asked the question to the, the vendor solicitor when they bought the property, have you done any structural alterations to the property that need uh, building consent, build and control consent from the council. If they'd said that, and the answer to that was no, and he subsequently found out they did, without permission, one probably from the freeholder, and secondly uh, from, from the building control at the council, then I should think there is a recourse if you can get hold of the person who, who sold the flat to you. And also, potentially to the solicitor, because they're very basic questions, Stephen, that should have been asked. Well, it's on the standard form, isn't it? You would have thought so. You would have thought so. But, you know, sometimes these things get missed. I can't tell you, as a freeholder of many, many properties, the amount of times we get an email saying, I'm just about to sell the flat. <laughs> I forgot to ask your permission to do certain works. Can, can, can you just confirm it's OK? No, we can't, Stephen, because we need to know whether that work needed, whether it needed building regulation approval or not, first of all, and what they've done, because it could affect the other flats in the block. Well, it could. I mean, one of the things there, though, John, it, it's, a, it's very careful to differentiate between the freeholder who will or will not give his consent on, on the basis of whether it's safe for the building and whether it would... Um, Might yeah, tell them to put it back as it was. May well do. Yeah. But in this case, he's specifically asking, I think, about the local authority. So are, are the lo local authority likely to get terribly heavy about this? Depending on the building inspector who's come round, I would say. But, I w but remember, we're building uh, regulation approval. There's no time limit. You know, we're planning if it's been in f a flat or something for 12 years without permission, you're probably OK with it. With uh, building regulation approval, there is no time limit. So they can come at any time and say, this isn't acceptable, put an enforcement notice on you to either do the work or put it back to how it was. And there could be very serious imp implications here for, for fire, for instance. So it, it, it's, it is serious okay. and you mustn't get yourself in this position. Trevor, that's the UK situation. What about in France? Uh, it's slightly different, obviously, because we don't have leaseholders. So um, every apartment building is made up of co proprietor which is like freeholders, shared freehold. Um, and then you have a uh, like a committee, basically, the uh, which, which, which is between the owners. That can either be run by an estate agent, and the estate agent can either be in charge of it. Um, they elect somebody on behalf of the owners. Uh, they sit. They have meetings normally twice a year. Um, most of what goes on in the building will know because they're all freeholders. You know, they, then they have all the responsibility of the freeholder. Yeah, can I just say that in this country, that's exactly what the government are trying to bring in, I think, next year. It's not law yet by any means, but they're going to bring in what's called a common hold. 
and, it, and you're going to have 999 year leases at zero ground rent. That's what they're trying to do. Yeah, they're it trying makes to sense. make it much, much more. Well, you might say that, Trevor, because you don't. You may not own any freeholds in the UK. <laughs> I can tell you from my <laughs> point of view, I'm losing out on ground rents, all sorts of things. It's a terrible situation for the freeholders. And there's a lot of very yeah, wealthy is, freeholders in London, well, in Westminster. John, I, John, I've got, I've got tears in my well, eyes for you. It, it, there's a lot of problems with this. This isn't, this isn't a simple thing the government are trying to do. Well, and I don't think they've thought it through very well. Well, I don't think they have, John. I think they have because people keep like, selling leases back to people that have already bought their properties That's it. once. That's it. And well, then they have to go and buy it again, John. Well, I don't if think you've only got a 99-year right. lease from 1950 or something and they come to us and want a longer lease, yes. They do have to pay for it. The government are cutting that down as well from next year. It's when somebody asks you what's going to happen at the end of 999 years, you struggle a little bit, don't you? Well, exactly. But anyway, all right, thank you for that, gents. Um, Trevor, your question. I have always loved France and have always holidayed there. In the light of Brexit, I am seriously considering purchasing a property and applying for a carte de séjour. My largest concern is simply whether the politics of the country will be suited to me. Are you able to give me some information on the political structure in France compared to that in the UK? And is it something a Brit might take some adjusting to? Good well, luck uh, with the question, Trevor. <laughs> yes, good luck with that one, Trevor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think in all fairness, our Brits will have always a bit of an issue adjusting to French politics because... Uh, we still have a country where the strong state, let's say, is appreciated by the French. They like to be looked after by their government. They like to feel secure in their country. They like to have a great health service and they love to have great schooling for everybody. So, yeah, it, is, it can take a bit of adjustment because uh, they're more involved in everything and that goes all the way from the local Mary in a village right up to your, your, your local council uh, are much more involved in day-to-day -day life. So it's kind of omnipresent. And if you're not used to that, then you might find it a little bit odd. But it, it, I've been living here now 32 years in France and frankly, I think it's quite a good thing. It's good to know each other's neighbours, it's good to get involved and it's good for everybody to be involved. So I think well, in time you get learned to appreciate. It was a shock to me and I used to hate it to begin with, to be honest, I used to say it was like a nanny state and everybody was in control of everything, but I've kind of learned to live with it and I, and I actually quite appreciate it now. So the answer to your question is yes, it can be a bit of a shock. It is different, it's a different culture. Um, but if you're not prepared to accept change, then you probably shouldn't leave the UK. No, well, it's no, it's no good trying to import the UK into France, is it? No, absolutely not, Steve. Trevor, you, you refer to uh, intervention, and uh, I want to address this to John too. We, we've had these awful tragedies, like like the, uh, the 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 fire we had at Grenfell, and there are things coming out about that that the cladding had been mislabeled, mis missold and was certainly a significant part of the cause of that fire. Um, how interventionist are the government over local authority sort of building regulations and controls in France, perhaps compared with the UK? In that respect, to be honest with you, they probably are, are far more lapsed than the UK. The building control as such is pretty non-existent. Um, planning regulations are quite strict as to where you can build. But as to what you can build, the only thing they're really strict on is insulation. Obviously, the government have, uh, as you know, President Macron in particular is, a, is, a, is, a, is an ardent ecologist. John's favourite politician. John's favourite politician, <laughs> yes. But he's, you know, he, he's an ardent ecologist. He pushes really hard that construction incorporates, and, and that's where it's strict, is... There's a new law just coming out this year now that we're going to have to deal with is we won't be able to sell principal residences without them, um, you know, basically without them complying well, to a threshold. Can yeah. I just, yeah, can I just say, Trevor, he should have, he should have done that on the cladding he sold into the UK, shouldn't he? Because it's French cladding that was on the, uh, on the French company, that the, the cladding was on the, the, the block that was such a disaster. Um, oh. You know, yeah, so... Uh, and also, as for, as for insulation, he's keen on insulation. He should make sure it's non-combustible as well. That would help, because it didn't help at Grenfell. 
John, do you think that, do you think the government or the local authorities intervene enough here in building regulations? Do you think we're hands on enough? It's got more and more um, involved over the years, and it's probably a good thing. You know, we all moan about it, but at the end of the day, people's safety is so important, and you can see what can happen if if if, if the wrong information is given and checks aren't made. You know, when you're Grenfell, you have to say, well, you know, there's a number of people you'd, like, you'd think who should have been more responsible, including the fire officers, because the fire officers go and check these blocks every year. Um, so the list goes on with that one, and I'm sure we've got, we've got to be careful what we say. Oh, oh, oh. We haven't had any incidents like that in France. God forbid that oh. you do, but they, all your blocks need to be checked. Uh, as they are there aren't that many UK. blocks, luckily because most of the blocks that were built in the 1960s and 70s have been demolished. Yeah. You know, they, 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 they most of what they call the, uh, the, the bon you know, the, the big RCLM blocks, which was like council housing blocks, have been demolished and replaced with lower housing, spread out over a bit of a bigger area, less density. Yeah. The yeah. plan is to get rid of all of them. Thank you very much, gents. That's all we've got time for in this half of the programme. Join me again after the break. Hello, welcome back to part two of Property Question Time. I'm Stephen Galpin and with me are John Howard and Trevor Leggett. Welcome back, guys. Thank you. John, your second question. Nice, simple one, but I'm guessing you're going to have a lot to say on this. <laughs> um, will the stamp duty holiday scheme that has been created be a, of long-term benefit or will it just create a short-term rush to buy and accelerate prices for the period that it's uh, available for? Well, there's a number of uh, things within that, really, aren't there? I mean, the first thing is, is that Rushi, uh, our very good uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer, I believe, um, has listened to the, the hundred... The, the, the one that's borrowed 17 point billion last the month. The one who had no choice but to borrow okay. that money. Right. Um, he listened to the 140,000 on a petition uh, and decided to extend the, the length, the, the time of the stamp duty holiday from April through to October based on a, on a gradually reducing, I think from August it reduces down um, as well. So it's a very sensible way of doing it. It was very dangerous to have a cut-off point when it did. It was going to affect over 100,000 purchasers. So there'll be 100,000 people buying who would have re tried to renegotiate the deal because they were saving up to 14,000, 15,000 pounds. So what he's done is really good. Um, will it suddenly drop off a cliff in October? Goodness knows, we were talking off air, Stephen, about the market, and I'm sure we'll talk about it um, <laughs> when we're off air again. I mean, I'm surprised at how strong it is. I know that Trevor in France is, is having a super time of it, selling all your wonderful properties as well, which even surprised me even more, to be honest with you, but there we go. Um, and who knows what happens after October, but I think pre the market's pretty safe this year on the back of the stamp duty holiday. Okay, and the effect when it finishes? Well, we just don't know, do we, Stephen? You and I thought the market last year would, would deteriorate more than it did. It didn't do that. It went up. It actually went up 7.1% in a year. So we were both wrong, and we've been at the job between us nearly eight, nearly 80 years. You more than me, of course. But um, so so what do we know? You know, it's so difficult to to assess. A lot of people are saying that, you know, property is almost ring fenced compared to the rest of the economy, uh, which is very interesting. The other thing to remember is there's been a billion, a um, hundred billion pounds saved during this lockdown period. And these people have got money and they're going out and they're buying houses in France, they're going buying them in, in the UK and elsewhere. So there's a big pent up demand again. And, and with my estate agencies, which are mainly, you know, they're up market agencies, we're seeing people moving out of London and other big cities paying very good money for property. Property prices are going up at the moment. Mm. Well, it wouldn't be the first time in my life I've been wrong. Or mine with property. You know, it's not easy. But I tell you what, if you're cautious, you're always on the safe side. It's always safe to be cautious. And if you're wrong because people are, haven't been, good luck to them. But I'm, I'm, I'm always like you. I'm always cautious. I, I, I'm always a little bit worried about these sort of interventionist schemes that the government come up with, the, you know, the, the, the help to buy. I do have this feeling that it was of more benefit to developers than it was to the purchasers. I don't, and, agree. And, I don't agree. Well, hold on, but that, that's not necessarily wrong. 
you know, you need, you need healthy development, you need supply of stock, and you need the ability of the people who want to buy that stock to be able to fund it. And that's, that's a critical point. What a fantastic property market we have in the UK. France have nothing like this. No. Well, nothing like this. 500,000 people have been support, have, have used the help to buy scheme. 500,000 people. It's hmm. a lot of people. What do you think, Trevor? Absolute rubbish. <laughs> well, I knew you'd say that. France hasn't got anything like this. The owner-occupier rate in this country is 15 points ahead of you I'm currently in. Trevor, I don't agree with that. We're, we're at about 62% in the UK. Well, um, we're, gonna, we're heading to 75. I, I, I would struggle to believe that. that. So you I give really me a would. rental, when, when properties are like less than 100,000 euros, it's cheaper to buy than it is to rent when you're borrowing at less than 1%. Fixed for term over 25 years. But you don't have the government. At the moment, I've got youngsters working for me who are borrowing at 0 0.8, 0 0.9 still, fixed for 25 years. You see, John, that is a difference to hear. I mean, you know, a lot of people are always very critical about these interest rates because, yeah, you see our bank rate at the moment at 0.01%, okay? And yet you try and get a mortgage under 4 or 5% and you'll struggle. That isn't true, Stephen. I'm sorry. You're, you're, correct at the, you're, you're correct if you want a 95% mortgage, perhaps. But if you want an 80% mortgage most or 75% mortgage, Most young people, that isn't John, haven't got 20%. Whatever country in the world will support a... with the government support a 95% mortgage? Whatever country in the world assists first-time buyers like the Help to Buy scheme? I, I don't believe there's any country in the world doing as, doing as much as we are in the, in the UK. That's it's because the prices are too high. The country is, people no want choice. to live in this country, Trevor. That's why the prices are high. We have a shortage of housing stock because people want to live here. That's why. Developers have deliberately held back land to keep prices up. I'm not sure they have, Trevor. I, I, I hear that a lot. And I, I, you know, maybe on the odd occasion, I would agree that the, t the big 10 house builders control 70% of the house building market and that's unhealthy and the government are trying to change that. In the 70s, small house builders like me and, and, and Stephen in, in his day and everybody else controlled 70% of the market. Now it's only 7% of the market is small, considered small house builders. We all consider small under, you know, under, uh, if, if, if you build less than say 300 or 400 houses a year, consider small. So 7% of the market, that's all but, that we do at the moment. But that's how the government are encouraging things. I mean, if you look at the rental market, they're trying to discourage small one, two, three, four buy to let landlords. You know, they want institutions providing the, the, the properties to, to let. I suppose because it's easier to collect taxes and easier to control and easier to, to legislate with. Well, also the standard of the accommodation, I think they see some of these small landlords as, as, not being, as not being the best in terms of the way they look after property, which I think was true 30 years ago, but I don't think it's true now. And I think private landlords support something like 20, 25% of the rental market in the UK. Hugely, hugely important to the to the rental market and, and uh, people like, um, you know, Robert Jenneric need to wake up and smell the coffee on that one. Next time I see him, I'll tell him. Sorry, John, but I mean, don't you think that all the time when it's cheaper to buy than it is to rent, which it was some time ago, people will buy. Currently, it's still a lot cheaper to rent than it is to buy. No, I, and with I, current mortgage rates, it's, you know. Trevor, it, I, I, Trevor I completely understand. I, I, I agree entirely what you're saying on that point is that of course, you know, if, 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 to, if, rent, if to rent is more expensive than to purchase, as long as they've got some sort of deposit, somehow, then the, the most people should buy. But it's not the case, unfortunately, because prices being so high... Well, that's, the why, the government, the government, so that's, that's why the government have stepped in to help. I don't think they have. Personally, I think it's the wrong idea. I agree with Stephen that government intervention in this incidence is just making the problem worse. We're allowed to disagree, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's called good conversation. OK, gents, well, let's move on. Trevor, your second question is this. Um, I've heard that it's relatively easy to buy a house in France. However, when it comes to selling it, this really, ah. can, this really can take a long time. Let's see. And it's quite expensive to do so. I'm therefore worried, as I'm not quite ready for settling down at my stage of life, is this something I should be concerned about? Well, 
I'll be entirely honest with you. Yes, it can be a problem because the, the issue isn't really that houses take a long time to sell. The problem is, is that houses are cheap. So in general, compared to the UK, you'll buy a house, a nice house for 250,000 euros. Um, and you'll sell it for 250 to 300,000 euros. The problem is, is that construction work, renovation works, and labor costs are generally more expensive in France than they are in the UK because the social security charges are higher and taxation is higher on labor. So the cost of actually restoring something can be more expensive than in the UK. The reason why people tend not to do quite so much work and overcapitalize on their properties, especially French clients, is they understand this and manage to refrain from going out and spending a couple of hundred thousand euros on their property they bought for 200,000 because they know damn well they're not going to get more than 300 for it at the end. Unfortunately, it does seem that some people tend to leave their brains at home and overcapitalize massively. Um, I mean, we often say to them, there's a limit to what you should be spending on this property, but you've got to also realize that people are buying for a lifestyle choice. They want what they want, and they're not all interested in getting a good return on investment. Some of them just want to live the last 20 years, 30 years of their lives, in the ideal place that they want to live, and they're not actually bothered if they're going to lose a hundred grand. Mm. Well, I think I think this is very this is very no, they're important. Not, John, really? Well, you know, you, Trevor, you've said how wonderful the property market is in France, and I and I understand that. You know, you've got a there's some beautiful areas of France, and you sell some beautiful properties for not a huge amount of money. Exactly. But you know, the UK property market is the best in the world, Stephen, because but, but you can make a lot of money just by owning your own home and keeping it five, ten years because there is a demand. There's less demand in places like France, and that's why they don't go up. John, that's okay. That's okay to a point, but I think you know we've had this on Property Question Time many, many times when people talk about buying a home and they start talking about investment in the same sentence. Now we have come to learn in this country that we can just rely on inflation to give us a big profit on our home. It's what's five happened five percent a year every year for 25 years on average on average that's what property well, that, prices that's have a, gone that, up in the uk well that's you a, can't say that about france that's oh, an average john and you know there's that's years when it's, it's, it's gone up 20 percent deadly that's what i call it deadly but I, but I think trevor's point is that people in france will tend to buy a home for a home yeah not, i agree i i agree with that and, and france is a, some beautiful areas of france i'm not trying to dissuade people from buying a house in france because it's a beautiful country shame about the politics but it's a beautiful country right well look on that emotive note um, we're going to have to close the show so um trevor leggett thank you very much for joining us by zoom from france thank you john howard good to see you trevor thank you for coming nice in all the way from Ipswich. <laughs> Thank you for coming into London. So that's all we've got time for. I'm Stephen Galpin. Join me again next time on Property Question Time.